Okay, so before we get into this uh, discussion and give you a little background, uh, as you may recall, Brian Laundry ultimately was found dead himself, and alongside him was his uh, backpack, and it had in it this diary. And there has just been released a, a statement that came from that diary. And again, this is effectively the confession written by Brian Laundry. Quote, I ended her life. I thought it was merciful, that it was what she wanted, but I see now all the mistakes I made. I panicked. I was in shock. But from the moment I decided took away her pain, I knew I couldn't go on without her. And that apparently preceded him killing himself. So uh, that just released from uh, the attorney for uh, Mr. Laundry. So uh, Kirk Nurmi, uh, procedurally, pretty tough to win a motion like this because the court is not quick to take these kinds of decisions out of the hands of a jury. What did you hear from the moving attorney here? Anything that suggests to you it might be successful? And uh, to avoid uh, being accused of a spoiler alert, the judge has not decided yet. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you know, right. It's interesting because we have this, what you said, novel approach to this case, right? This intentional affliction of emotional distress, which requires extreme outrageous conduct. And in here, that conduct that they're claiming is extreme and outrageous is two things. One, not talking, and two, the, the statement made by the attorney that they hope Gabby Petito is found, all making that state while knowing, under their contention anyway, that Miss Petito has already died. The problem with this is it relies on that assumption that Miss Petito has already died and that the parents knew that she had died and where she was, right? So there's a problem there in that you know, we also wrap that up around if Brian did, in fact, tell his parents that he had committed this killing and where her body was. There's also a potential Fifth Amendment issue, isn't there? Because if they're going on vacation, if they're aiding him in any way, then there's potential for criminal conduct, which they haven't been charged with because there's no evidence to support that. And it's also hard for me to believe that silence, when we talk about that tort, extreme and outrageous conduct, counts as you know, it counts as conduct, silence, inaction, compulsory action, compulsory speech is against the Fifth Amendment and it's against a lot of what this country stands for. Now, the statement of the attorney, too, that's interesting because when we talk about this conduct and this statement, and obviously we see statements that can lead to defamation, we saw that and heard the death, but hoping that the body is found, it's hard for me to see that from a legal standpoint as being defamatory. That's why I think the judge, if he wants this to go forward, is going to have to do some real gymnastics here in order to put this in front of a jury because it seems to me while the more morality is on the side of the Petito family, the law is with the Landrys. And we'll see, Celicia, if, um, you know, if the court rules against this motion, and my gut is that they will, the, the issues of tribal fact will be, to Kurt's point, uh, you know, what did these parents know? When did they know it? What what they could could they have done differently? And maybe there's even a First Amendment issue here. Uh, do they have an obligation uh, somehow to to advise the others involved in this? I, I I don't know. What are your thoughts? You know, this is you have a moral issue and you have a legal issue. Um, this is a tough one, and it, I don't think it's necessarily a case of first impression, but it's not one I don't think that we see often. Um, I. I must say that um, I really don't quite see a Fifth Amendment um, argument here because this is not, there was no criminal implication, there's no criminal arrest, um, and Fifth Amendment really applies to the government, and this is not a criminal case, it is a civil case. However, if the, the um, defendant in this case believes that they may be criminally prosecuted. Well, that's a course of a different color. And as the plaintiff counsel said, you know, let us know about that. But what the judge has to make the decision about is what's in the four corners of that document, of the complaint. And mind you, the complaint is not, the complaint is simply a good faith basis of facts that you know at that time. Oftentimes, complaints are amended, sometimes more than once, for different reasons. Or you may supplement a complaint and amend it that way. But at this time, it's a good faith information. It is not evidence. Now, for a motion to dismiss, well, you have to have, uh, the judge is going to look at a lot of issues, of course, what's in the four corners, 
but whether or not there are any issues of genuine dispute, material disputes together. And if there are, those issues must go to a jury. And I, I believe that in this case that um, this will go, this will be a jury question. Yeah, I agree. I've got here, this is the amended complaint, at least the first amended, I believe. Unclear what they had to change the first time around. Let me ask you this. Uh, they call it demur in Florida or a motion to dismiss? Just a straight motion to dismiss? Oh, the motion to dismiss. Okay. Motion California, to they call dismiss. it a demur, yeah. basically. It's the same thing. It's saying that, uh, here, I'm reading the pleadings here. I, I, you got nothing, plaintiff. Uh, and it's, that's why That's why it's, I can count on one hand the times as a defense attorney I've won on demur. It's, it's brutal. Uh, for the reasons we mentioned. Okay, we'll take a break here. There was a winner today in the Candy the Dog case. A jury came back with their verdict. We'll talk about that right after this break.